People, 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 welcome back to another pre-recorded podcast of the Arsenio Buck Show, bringing to you today, The Aggressive Mask, Part 2. Now, remember, I told you guys last Sunday, it kind of fell apart and whatnot, but we're back on it, and this, of course, is a pre-recorded podcast, because I have a massive project this morning, um, and it's funny, I'm saying this, like, as it's present day, but it's really not, I'm, like, actually four or five days behind, <laughs> But you know what? I just wanted to post this here, man. I hope you guys enjoy this one. And, man, we got to get back into this aggressive mask. And I'm going to get into a very ugly story. Um, Aggressive mask part two. Here we go. There was a quote, of course, by Lewis Hose in his book. He said, unaddressed anger is the glue that keeps the aggressive mask stuck in place. Unaddressed anger. Starting very early and lasting, in many cases, for decades. There's research on this, and it testifies to how much young boys in particular are soaked in anger. For many of them, anger is the only emotion that is accept- acceptable to express. If you want to look at blueprints, of course, like I told you so much about the emotional blueprints, geographical blueprints, a lot of different blueprints out there. Um, There's no way in hell that you... Are you have those sort of genetics? Remember, I told you guys about the story back in 2003, 2004. Now, okay, I'm gonna give you a nice little background of all of this. Uh, I've told you guys this probably a little bit vaguely, but in 2003, there was a girl by the name of Adriana Arce. She was Costa Rican, but Costa Rican American. It's funny how that's happening right now. A little bit of foreshadowing again. Um, and I remember I liked her so much. We talked all summer long. She was a little intern at the age of 15 making money. I was pissed. And, man, she was a delightful girl. She was so wonderful. She had such a wonderful smile. Oh, my God. I still remember her face. I haven't seen her in 11 years. Anyways, I haven't talked to her in even longer. So, here we go. Adrienne, I remember I liked her so much. And there was this one guy by the name of Edison. Never knew him. Had a big mole on his face. Wasn't very look good to look at. And I remember during lunchtime, this guy came right up behind her and started hugging her. And I stood there in shock. And she was letting it happen. She was on her phone. He was hugging her. And I ended up going to class. I was so angry. I was infuriated. It was kind of like, oh, well, was that your girlfriend? No, not necessarily. But the thing is, we were kind of seeing each other for so long. And I was just appalled by the entire situation i went home that day and i was so angry i was like how dare you have this man come up from behind and hug you while i'm standing there what the hell were you thinking what are you thinking this and that and oh my god so many different things were just running through my mind i was just so angry and she's like oh my god i'm so sorry and i think i saw the next day or something like that and you know i think by that time i was just like over it but at the same time i still had feelings for her then one of her close friends by the name of maria ventura who I actually just found on Facebook, apparently was on Facebook, and oh my god, I'll get into that story a little bit later, that was in 2009, but this was way, way young, this is 2003, we were in band, my feelings started developing for her, started developing for Adriana, and I think somebody along the way ended up saying, hey, I saw Arsenio kissing Maria one day, and I saw Arsenio kissing Adriana one day, and it was so funny, it was funny as hell, um, yeah, I was a bad boy, um, But at the same time, my mom didn't have a job. We didn't have much food in the house. Power got cut off for a day. I was a sophomore in high school, 15. Um, A lot of things took place over the next, uh, the latter part of 2013. I remember uh, me and my brother got a fight at band practice, marching band practice. I went home, and of course my mom takes the side of that, that specimen and I ended up getting really angry. I ran. I ran to my friend, childhood friend, uh, Mark Tolentino's house, and I went there. I was crying. His mom looked at me. She said, hey, don't worry. You can sleep here, so I slept there. I went back. I didn't talk to my mom for about, I think, seven to ten days or something like that, Um, and then she was still going for job interviews. We still didn't have any money, and then I think throughout that time, man, with that happening, you know, I think the Yankees won the World Series. No, they didn't win the World Series that year, but I remember my mom was screaming almost every night, and Carlos was there. He was next to Ken for me. He was one of those people that was always there for me. And he was like, man, it was was so funny because I remember taking a picture. uh, Well, I just took a picture recently, probably in the last year, posted on Facebook about Mexican food here in Bangkok. 
And he's like, man, shut up, man. We used to eat, we used to eat hot dogs on uh, Wonder Bread or something like that. <laughs> Wonder Bread is basically, it's not even a hot dog, but it's just like a single bread. And I was dying because that was around the same time I was going through these issues. And I do believe that that mindset, it cultivated and just culminated into something much worse. Because by November, uh, Maria, for whatever reason, she stopped talking to me. Adriana just completely disappeared. And I remember I tried talking to her at lunch one day, and her friends were calling me names. And I said, can I talk to you? She's like, no. Like, their friends were just screaming at me. I was like, what the hell? And I was like, Adriana, you know, uh, I don't know what's going on. I don't know. And she's like, yeah, okay, whatever. And I was like, okay, uh, well, to hell with that. And I remember, oh, my God, at this same moment, this is what I hate so much. Because at that same day, I walked into band class, and these there's a baritone saxophone, a tenor saxophone, which is the second biggest, and then you had an alto. There was, a, there was four of them. It was like a, a – I forgot what it was. It was like some kind of soprano something. And they were playing, like, one of the saddest songs I've ever heard in my life. And, of course, every time I hear – well, I haven't heard that song since then. But it was a beautiful, beautiful song. But, um, ooh, man, it sounded like the song off Titanic when they were playing it on the violin. Uh, when everyone was just rushing and everything. Whatever. Okay, so it, I swear it sounded like that. No, it was very, very close, though. Anyways, okay, so what am I trying to get at here? You're like, okay, Arsenio, good story. What's going on? By the time December came around, my mom sold the truck. She got money for it. She ended up getting a job in January. We were so happy. Um, but that entire December, I was lost. I really was. I remember my brother, he was going through a breakup and whatnot. I remember in January, that's when everything started. So it just went from like, it went from a very turbulent August, uh, September. September and October were very fun months until everything fell apart with both Maria and Adriana. And then December came, uh, I was sad, you know, I just played, you know, Max Payne and different games on the, you know, PlayStation and whatnot, and going into 2004, anger developed, because then that's when I started playing, you know, Blitz, if you guys know that game, Blitz 2003, that's an, an American football game, every time I lost, I would scream, and I would cry, literally cry, and hit the floor, slam the controller, I remember North Carolina, I really liked North Carolina basketball at that time. They lost to Duke the first time, um, Duke, the Duke Blue Devils, uh, two stupid universities. Uh, yeah, they lost to them, and I went upstairs. I was so angry. And I remember my mom, she looked at her friend, Al, who I consider to be a father still to this day, and she, she was like, what's wrong with my son? And honestly, I didn't know what was going on. I wasn't talking to anyone or anything, you know? And the next thing you know, there was a guy named Manny. And this, of course, stems back to the athlete mask. Um, there's a guy named Manny. He's like, Arsenio, you still want to do track? I was like, oh, yeah. He said, come with me. Let's go to Coach Meyer's office. I went in there, shook the man's hand. Coach Meyer from Iowa. <laughs> oh, man, what a wonderful guy. Funny as hell, wonderful. Just a great personality. Um, and he's like, oh, you want to run track, huh? All right, come out come out tomorrow and I thought it was like a competition I was like oh man okay okay what am I gonna what am I supposed to do uh, you know with, with this track and field competition I'm like man what am I, you know uh yeah, well that this wasn't necessarily a competition or whatnot but it was tryouts I guess you could say and I remember there was about four to five heats we had some of the fastest runners we had the best four by 100 team in the state of Nevada and they dropped the baton on the last uh what is it the state championship race oh my god it was horrific but um I couldn't believe that. But yeah, anyways, yeah. So that very first day, it was like the turning point because I remember I went home and I was like so sore. You know, I was like, my legs hurt. Why are my legs hurting so much? And what I thought, I thought I was a very fast runner. Man, you uh-uh. I ran in like the, the last heat. The monsters ran like in the first and second heat, you know, and these were just tryouts to see how fast we ran the 100 meters and whatnot. Oh, my God. Guys, that was the beginning of the change. But granted, I was still going through these repressed re emotions because I remember we went to a place called Tower in Las Vegas where they sold a lot of CDs and stuff like that. My brother was buying things, and I tried telling my mom to buy me some, and he just kept saying, no, 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 no. So we were going back home, and I started crying in the car. 
And I was like, don't talk to me. I was saying that to my brother and stuff like that. And then I just didn't talk to anyone. Um, and then, of course, Al came back around. And the shoes that I actually wanted, you know, my mom ended up buying them for me and whatnot. Um, and even going into the first track meet in Bullhead City, Arizona, um, I thought I was a remarkably fast runner. I thought I was going to do wonderful on the hurdles. I never actually even ran it in practice. Only a couple times, but I didn't know how fast the others were going to be. So I told this guy right next to me, he was a big guy with long hair. I was like, good luck. He's like, you too. And we came out the blocks, and I thought I came out the blocks pretty good too. I, I thought I was completely, I was faster than everyone. But then I had no idea that it was three steps in between each hurdle. <laughs> so here I am taking like six steps and stutter step in between the hurdles and I came in last. I slammed my hands on the track. I started crying. Oh, my God. Because I was still going through those emotions, man. Oh, that was so fun. Um, So then the 300-meter hurdles came, and I whipped ass in that. I kicked ass. I turned all that emotion into all that repressed emotion over the last five months from Adriana and Maria all the way up to that point, that nasty 100-meter race just a couple hours before. In that 300-meter race, I had the endurance, I had everything, and I came out flying in my heat, and I did very, very well. And honestly, I don't ever remember having anger problems ever again after that. I don't. That's, a, that's the very, very interesting thing. That's the most interesting part about life, uh, really. It really is because... How was I able to revert something where I had emotional issues? It could have came from girls and then leading up to family problems and then it festering up into sports and next, you know, video games, so many different things. And after that, you know, of course, when I was, you know, the track and field guy, Maria came back and she ended up being terrible to me. And we got into a six day relationship. Next, you know, I saw her hold the hands with another guy. I was like, what the hell's going on? And then she dumped me. And then Carlos, apparently this mother, this mother freaker, is a, he's, he's a clairvoyant, so he's like, oh, she's going to tell you this now because he was on the other line. Well, he was right next to me while I was talking to her on speaker. And he's like, oh, she's going to tell you this. She's going to tell you this. Hang up the phone. It was like three It was like three big lies. He's like, hang up the phone. Fuck her. Hang it up. Hang it up. Hang it up. And so, yeah, I never talked to her again. Um, I didn't talk to her for like two years. So <laughs> 2009, I'm going to give you guys this story before we get back into some more. These are good stories, man. Uh, 2009, she sent me an email. I still remember her email. S-I-L-B-N-T. Sylvia Benitez at AOL.com. Doesn't really matter. You guys can look it up. Um, Who cares? Um, This was nine years ago. She sent me an email. She's like, oh, I'm in Vegas. I'm having such a great time. And I was like, okay, do you want to meet? No, I didn't ask her that yet. But she's like, oh, guess what? I had sex. I'm like, okay, why are you telling me this? Is she, oh, like, who comes into my life three years later telling me I had sex? And of course, no MySpace, no this, no that at the time in 2000. And, well, there was, but not that much. Uh, and I didn't talk to her, but she sent me an email. And next thing you know, I was like, okay, you keep telling me about this party and drinking and doing this and doing that. Can we meet? She's like, oh, well, I'm going to have to fit you into my schedule. I said, and I told Andre, of course you guys know Andre. I was like, Andre, look at this. Look what she said to me. He was like, oh, hell no. Nah. I said, oh, hell no. I said, he said, oh, hell no. Nah. I said, oh, hell no. Nah. He said, hell no. Nah. I said, yeah, she did. I went right to the keyboard. I said, B word. Oh, who the hell do you think you are? Are you famous? Tell you what. Don't ever email me again. <laughs> And that was the end of Maria. Oh, God. Those are good times, man. That was actually in 2009. That was one month after I went to Australia. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, what did she just say? I said, okay, you're outside your goddamn mind. You are stupid. Uh, I don't care about you anymore. I don't care why you're telling me about these sex stories and stuff like that. And I said, get out my face. And so, yeah, that was the end of her. <sighs> but guys, just saying, you know, in terms of having those unaddressed angers, all that anger, it came from so many different things. There was a writer in, um, or there is a writer in Lewis Ho's book by the name of Ashley Burch. She said, when an emotion sneaks in, 
for a male character like in video games, kind of like when I play Blitz. By and large, it's anger. And any sort of grief is very, very underplayed and never actually discussed or processed. Kids end up really looking up to, you know, that character or these characters or whoever it may be. And what they end up idolizing is someone who cannot express themselves emotionally, cannot be honest or open with anyone around them. It could be in the video game, but they end up becoming that person in the video game. It's kind of like in a movie. When I watch movies now, it's not like when I used to watch movies 15 years ago. When I watch movies, I'm in the movies. I feel the atmosphere. I feel everything that's going on. I don't know how I do it, but I do because I'm just so into it. Those two hours that I'm in a movie... Nothing around me exists, unless it's a shitty movie. Excuse my language. Yeah, but yeah, just saying. Um, I've had you know one of I've had a crazy childhood, and some of you probably do know this. No, actually, I don't think any of you know this story. So I'm just gonna get into this, and then uh, we're gonna end this bad boy because this is a crazy long podcast. So, okay, so in 1997. I remember I came home, and my mom, she was gone, and the police were over. And I'm like, what happened? And my dad was like, your mom's going to jail. I said, what? She had domestic violence. Apparently, she was trying to stab him. (laughs) I know you guys are like, what? What are you laughing for? I said, I don't know. I don't know what was happening 20 years ago, 21 years ago. I was just a kid. Um, And my dad ended up taking sole custody of us. And I remember we were just so much more clingy to my mom. She lived with a lady. I forgot her name, but it was way, way far out in the, in, in a place called Lone Mountain, which is now very, very developed. Of course, 20 years later, there's a bunch of homes and stuff out there. Um, but before 20 years ago, it was just all desert and just one house in the middle of nowhere. And so my mom lived there. She would only get the rights to see us every now and then she would have to drop us off the corner drop us off at the corner um of the street she couldn't come she had a restraining order so many different things and so my dad had custody of us so the first lady he ended up dating was a lady an italian lady right out of brooklyn by the name of lisa lisa was a wonderful soul Lisa tried everything to keep food in our stomach she bought us food she was fantastic and I think you guys probably, I talked about this just a little bit. And next thing you know, there was one time we were living in budget suites. Literally, it was a studio apartment. There were six of us living there. Four of us slept right there in the living room. Okay, TV on one side. You could scoot the TV on over to the other side. Blah, 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 blah. And yeah, so it was a very small bathroom, very small place. It was it was just a, literally a, one, a half-ass bedroom. I remember one morning I woke up and there was a white lady standing in the home in our uh, apartment. I was like, who is that? My dad was like, that's Kim. He said, we're going to be moving in with her. I was like, hello, Kim. She's like, hi. Redhead. Straight from Missouri. And so Kim, um, Kim was a very, uh, how can I say it? Kim was a very interesting uh, person because that bond I had with Lisa, I, we didn't have with Kim. Lisa was a very remarkable cook. And Kim was probably 20% of that. And so I recall us going all the way to the other side of town. And what was the first place? Where was the first place we started living? I can't remember. But we were living at Budget Suites off Tropicana next to New York, New York. You guys can look that up. Excalibur, the Luxor, you guys probably know those buildings. Not too far from there, man. We were living there in Budget Suites. Hated it. Uh, went to a school named Helen Judge Strupp, too. Man, I wish I could get in contact with any of those people from there. I still remember my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Recruit. Man, next thing you know, fifth grade. Man, you know what? I didn't go to school for a while. I almost got held black. I almost got held back because my my father, he didn't have the birth certificate. He didn't have a social security. He didn't have anything up for, you know, so that we could register for school. So we moved in with Kim more on the westward side of town. And Kim, she had a son and a daughter. Son was Emily, redhead freckles. Son, Brandon, tall, very tall for his age, four years younger than me, and he was my height. And he, blonde hair, blue eyes, of course. They were all from Missouri. So I remember living with them, and we were living in that area. My brother, there was a big fight, apparently, and I still remember my brother was just taunting my father. My brother was only like 13, no, he was like 12 or something. 
Brother kicked him out, sent him over there with his mama, dropped him off. And after that, I didn't have a big brother around there. There was a lot of fights all the time for some reason, raging hormones of the young males, you know what I mean? And so it kept going, it kept continuing and whatnot. Um, We lived there, but I don't remember anything bad happening at that specific moment, but we moved to another side of town. And I went from going from Helen Durfelt. I still remember that school's name. Helen Durfelt. My my grades were terrible because I couldn't focus. Honestly, I didn't even have breakfast. My father barely even fed us. You know, it's crazy that I'm, I'm like alive right now. man. <laughs> oh, we go to the other side of town. And I also believe that this was a loophole into 2000, 2001 and a lot of anger emotions that I probably had when I was younger. Brandon would call me the N-word. And so we would be playing basketball. And he'd be like, man, fuck you. And he would say the N-word. And the N-word, if you guys don't know that, I ain't telling you nothing about it. But it's a very derogatory term towards African Americans to basically degrade them. And it's basically what Anglos use for the last, and continue to use for like the last 500 to 1,000 years. Uh, but yeah, slavery, all that stuff, Willie Lynch, you know, of course that, the, the letter to the slave owners back in 1712, all that horrendous stuff. So, you know, that happened, uh, that word, anytime he said it, I would just kick his ass, literally. Remember, he'd walk home with bloody nose, he'd be like, mom, something happened to Brandon. Mom would be like, what happened? Our city will hit me. And I'd be like, yeah, because you call me the N-word. Crickets. Nothing, nothing was said after that, nothing else, and so they were, and, and you know what, I ultimately ended up breaking up that relationship because I ripped up a, a Mother's Day card, apparently for Kim, and em, Emily made it, her daughter made it, and then she went crying to her mom, and she was like, somebody ripped up my card, and and Kim looked at my dad, she's like, this is why I don't want your kids, this and that, and then the big, big argument happened, gone. So, uh, they're seriously drilling right now. It's so annoying. Anyways, we're going to keep going. So, yeah, that was basically the bottom line. That was the beginning of my childhood. And it was very, very up and down. I went to three different schools compared to one school in the previous, what, four years. I went to three different schools in almost one calendar year. And then finally, after a couple other things that happened... Oh my god, they're probably drilling right next to me. I'm about to start kicking walls. But anyways, guys, I really wanted to tell you guys that story because we've all had those types of issues. Um, I did end up meeting back up with, um, with Kim and a couple other people. Uh... In 2006, Facebook, I'm getting completely thrown off right now. No, it was MySpace, 2006. We ended up meeting up with Kim. She ended up adding. Emily ended up adding us. Brandon ended up adding us. And then Kim was like, oh, this and that. And we started trying to make amends. And then I guess they just disappeared after that. I got rid of my MySpace. And then I hadn't talked to them in about 12 years. So, yeah, that's the end of it. But, man, that's a little bit of the story. So, if you actually go back to the genesis of what's happening in your life right now, if you're very antsy if you get angry real quick or if things start happening and you your emotion goes up and down you really want to look into that go back to the genesis of the problem because once you're able to address that you could get over it and that's one of the biggest things so i just wanted to give you guys a couple of stories on that a couple of quotes and now we are all finished with this podcast my goddamn mouth is dry as hell so thank you so much to all of you guys who have tuned into this podcast stay tuned for the next one i'm about to cuss goddamn bastard oh oh, sorry oh okay so anyways guys have a wonderful morning afternoon and evening this is your host arsenio if you got any questions fire them fire them in over and out